This is for the ethics review class at Parker University. Many small businesses have trouble making a distinction between who is an employee and who is an independent contractor. That classification of workers is important and can have very serious consequences if the small business owner does not make the appropriate classification. So just to start with the basic definitions. An independent contractor is a worker where the customer has the right to control only the result of the work and not the means and methods of accomplishing the result. Common law employee, on the other hand, is a person who performs services uh, where the business has the right to control what will be done and how it will be done. Essentially, the difference has to do with how much control the uh, employer has over the worker's work. The less control the employer has, the more likely the worker is an independent contractor. The more control the employer has, the more likely it is the worker is a common law employee. So for example, if you own a home and you hire someone to build a fence, that probably is an independent contractor. You're not regulating or controlling how they do the work. You're not controlling who they bring to help them do the work. You're not controlling what hours they're there or not there. Um, on the other hand, hiring somebody to work in a chiropractic office and to use specific forms and to be present at specific hours and to handle patients in a specific way, that is almost certainly to be an employment relationship rather than an independent contractor. Now, the reason small businesses struggle with this distinction is because once you call someone an employee instead of an independent contractor, it places some additional burdens on the uh, employer. For an independent contractor, if you hire an independent contractor and you agree to pay them $1,000, when the job is done, you pay them $1,000 and you're done. But with an employee, if you hire an employee to work for a week for $1,000, you ought to pay them better than that, by the way. But if you hire an employee to work for a week for $1,000, at the end of the week, you don't just write the, the employee a check for $1,000. You're going to write them a check for somewhat less than that because you're going to have to withhold federal income tax. You're going to have to withhold Social Security and Medicare tax. In addition to making those deductions from the $1,000, the employer is also going to have to pay some amounts in addition, they're going to have to pay federal unemployment tax, and they're going to have to pay a matching tax on the Social Security and the Medicare tax. It also creates a paperwork burden. The employer will be required to issue a Form W-2 in January. That's the statement that says how much the employee was paid and how much was withheld. The employer will also have to file at least a quarterly tax return on Form 941 with the IRS that spells out how much is with, was withheld and, of course, turns that money over to the IRS. So I'll kind of talk about a few examples in a typical chiropractic office. An associate doctor is almost certainly an employee. The owner of the clinic is probably telling the doctor when to work, what forms to use, how to treat patients, overseeing how they're treating patients, how to bill for services, how to collect for services. All of that's being directed by the owner of the clinic, then that associate doctor is not an independent contractor. Uh, chiropractic assistants are pretty easily classified only as employees. Essentially, the chiropractic assistant is unable to do anything unless it's being done under the supervision of a doctor. And if the doctor is exercising an appropriate level of supervision, that CA is an employee, not a contractor. Bookkeeper can probably come under either, depending on the circumstances. If a bookkeeper is working for one office, either part-time or full-time, and they're almost spending most of their time with that particular office. That bookkeeper is almost certainly an employee. On the other hand, there are bookkeepers out there who may have a number of clients. Perhaps they work for 30 or 40 different clinics. 
and those clinic those bookkeepers are most likely independent contractors because the clinics are not exercising much control over what those bookkeepers do. A receptionist is another example that's pretty easily classified as an employee. The owner of the clinic is directing the receptionist as far as the hours that they will work, typically directing what tasks they'll do other than answering the phone and answering the door, telling them how to set appointments, how to keep records of appointments, how to take messages, how to answer the phone, etc. That's almost certainly an employee. Now, the IRS does have a, a form called an SS-8 that can be filed to ask their opinion about whether a worker is a contractor or an employee. The IRS understands this is not always an easy decision. I think the people who run into problems are the ones who, who have an easy decision. It's pretty clear the worker should be an employee, but for whatever reason, the employer or business owner decides to call them an independent contractor to take a shortcut so they don't have to pay that extra money or file those tax returns. Of course, when the IRS catches up with them, the business owner is going to have to pay those extra taxes as well as penalties and interest. I'm going to show you what the IRS tests are for distinguishing between independent contractors and employees. I'm not going to go through it in any, in any detail. The, the long-standing test is this 20-factor test. And the only reason I mention it is because some states still follow this 20-factor this test, even though the IRS has replaced it. Essentially, what the IRS says is we're going to look at all 20 factors, and there's no single factor that's determinative. The weight and importance of each of the various factors varies depending upon the context in which the services are provided or performed. Essentially, they're saying it's a judgment call. Look at these 20 factors. It's not a matter of totaling them up and saying 10 one way, 10 the other, uh, or, or 15 one way and 5 the other, then that's how we determine. It's a matter of looking at all these different facts. Now, there's a few facts, factors that I think probably bear a little more importance. This fourth factor on the list, whether the services must be rendered personally. That's a pretty good indication that this is an employment relationship and not an independent contractor. Think about the example of hiring someone to do my fence. If they're building my fence, I really don't care whether that person is there individually or whether they send someone else to build the fence. On the other hand, if you've got somebody working in your office as an associate doctor, you probably want that individual there and, and you don't want them choosing somebody else to show up in their place. These 17th and 18th factors also are a pretty good indication. Uh, whether the workers perform services for more than one business and whether the worker makes their services available to the general public. If the worker has one client and the business owner is that client, that worker is probably an employee. If the worker only has two or three clients, then there might be an argument that could be made one way or the other. But if the worker has 20 or 30 clients and they advertise to the general public, then they're almost certainly an independent contractor. So look at these factors and think about them if you're having trouble making a decision. Now, the IRS recognized over the years that this 20-factor test was not very useful. So back in 2006, they published what was supposedly a simplified way to decide whether someone's an independent contractor or an employee. And, and they said that they needed to look or, or, or that the decision is based on three categories. How much control is exercised over the worker's behavior, the financial control, and the type of relationship. If you go read through the uh, uh, new test, that IRS publication 15A, you're going to find essentially what they've done is take the old 20-factor test They've excluded a few of the factors, but almost all of them are still there. And in, instead of listing them out individually, they've kind of grouped them into these three categories. We still have the factor about what work must be performed by a specified individual. Uh, can the worker send somebody else to do the job, or is the worker expected to be there individually? 
whether the worker makes their services available to other customers is also still there. So it's very much the same test or a very similar test. And although there are situations where it can be difficult, again, I think the message in the chiropractic office is almost always the worker should be categorized as an employee and the business owner needs to take the responsibility to file the appropriate taxes uh, uh, and pay the appropriate taxes in connection for that. And the real key again is whenever there's doubt, whenever it's a close call as to whether a worker is an employee or an independent contractor, always the safe thing to do is to categorize the worker as an employee and to pay those taxes to the IRS.